right, everybody, let's start the show for today. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host here every week with you, and I am a filmmaker that's been working with the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation for a decade. 2011 was when I first was introduced to Grace Goldstein and Keith uh, Warner of CCF. We have worked uh, a lot over the past 10 years to, to bring video content, multiple you know, versions of video. A lot of times we do short documentaries. Now we do a lot of live video, all with the same purpose and mission in mind, which is to raise awareness and educate people about neuroendocrine tumors. So if you are a regular uh, at the show, I see people already starting to chime in. Hello from Fredericton, Canada and Arizona. Hi, Rain. We love you, Wendy. We love you back. Thank you for that. So let us know where you're signing on from in the world. I always love to see how far this program reaches uh, inevitably every week, even though we're live at lunchtime uh, in the Eastern time of the U.S. We have people from South Africa and Australia and India and all these places where you would think that they would be going to bed, but they're here with us. And that says a lot about the cult, the community that we've cultivated here. And that's, uh, that's something I'm really proud about. So say hello to uh, everybody in the comment section. We're going to keep going and start the show. But before we start, we always like to thank our sponsor, our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. And we like to include this disclaimer from them that says the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. And audience members should not rely solely on the, on the opinions or information expressed and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. That last line is indeed the takeaway that I want you to latch on to. We're going to give you some great advice. We're hopefully going to answer some of your questions, but by no means do we or our guests know your specific case. So take those answers, take that advice to your home team, which does, and make the best decisions for your path moving forward. As we all know, and we talk about every week, each case of this disease is different and each path forward is as well. All right, so today our guest is uh, filling in for us as we had a previous guest who got pulled away from for the COVID issues happening in Tennessee, which is pretty bad, I hear. It's a shame that we're st still struggling with this. And our guest, Dr. Joseph Dillon, who was supposed to be here in October, was kind enough to join us today. How are you, Dr. Dillon? I'm good. Thanks, Rain. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Thanks so much for being here. And I know that people are excited to hear from you. For those who aren't familiar with you and the work that you do, uh, tell us tell us who you are and the role you fit uh, fill in this neuroendocrine tumor community. Where do you work? What do you do? Sure. Well, I work at a University of Iowa. I'm currently the medical director of the multidisciplinary uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor clinic at the University of Iowa. I took over that role recently from the, the founder and my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Odorizio. Uh, I'm a medical endocrinologist uh, like Tom Odorizio uh, by, by background training. So I, I, I work collaboratively with medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all of those uh, great other people in the group. Got it, got it. And definitely a shout out to Dr. Tom Odoricio, who was here a couple of weeks ago with us, um, and even the month before. Uh, I have spent some time, I met Dr. Dillon in person before, you know, before pandemic <laughs> times, and we were shooting some video, and the team there at Iowa is uh, is incredible. Uh, A.G. Dab says, hello from East Tennessee. I hope everything's okay there, A.G. in Tennessee. Sounds like things are a little little dicey and I'll be there in October, so hopefully it clears up. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, Lunch with the Experts is a program where we try to get to as many questions from you as possible. We get a lot every week, so and undoubtedly and inevitably, we don't get to them all. If we don't get to your question or if our answer prompts a follow-up question and we don't have time to get to that, I urge you to reach out to CCF after the show. You can message them on their Facebook page. You can send them a direct message. You can also email them or contact them at their website, carcinoid.org. They'll get you the information that you need or the people who will get you the information and the answers that you are seeking. And also the video will be evergreen. The video will live here on the Facebooks, uh, on the Facebook uh, page of CCF under the videos tab starting Monday. We will repopulate that and republish that to YouTube for those who don't uh, have Facebook. So just know you can always watch the show again. If you join late, like a lot of people might come halfway through, 
You can always watch the show over again. But the real value, I think, is for people being here live and, and having this virtual interactive session with a, with a leading expert. So if you know someone who would benefit from the show, do me a favor, go ahead and tag them in the comments, share this video on their Facebook page, text them, email them, whatever you can do to let them know this is going on. Let's try to get as many people here as possible. And I also would like to ask you, I say this every week and you guys do a great job of it. And I appreciate you for that. If you see a question in the, in the comment section that you also have, the way you can help me do my job, which is to help you, is to either they give you a lot of options of what reaction you can use, but you can like it, love it, any of the, the uh, right under the comment, it will say like or reply. And if you hit like, what it will do is effectively upvote that question. If I see seven people have the same question, I'm going to make sure to get that one across. So that will be very helpful for me. And uh, yeah, start sending in those questions now. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. I want to say before we get started that today and throughout the month of September, we're recognizing uh, with appreciation, amazing women physicians in the net community. Uh, and even though we're here with Dr. Dylan, we still want to send a shout out to all uh, the women. This is Women in Medicine Month. And so we want to send a shout out to all the women uh, physicians that are helping us fight this, uh, this disease and helping us move forward with it. Okay, uh, Dr. Dylan, we've, all, we've already kind of approached this subject. I spent time with you uh, in Iowa, specifically looking at the multidisciplinary team that you all have there. And we've already kind of talked about that briefly today. As I told you before we started, this is something that comes up basically every week. But, but from, from your perspective, from a center that has kind of led the way in a lot of ways in, in this capacity, why is that so important for a net patient to, to why is it so important for, for net doctors to have a multidisciplinary approach? And why is it so important for a patient to seek out a multidisciplinary center? Yeah, uh, I, th I think it's very important, uh, perhaps uh, because of uh, the, the, the rare disease aspect of this. So, mm -hmm. so uh, for, uh, for a, a patient, it's, it's, it's difficult enough to find one individual who has, who has word recognition for some of the the uh, the aspects of of, of neuroendocrine tumor care uh, but then it, you know there's it I, I think it's basic human nature that if you if you go to a surgeon she will offer you surgery if you go to a, 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 a an endocrinologist he or she will want to play around with your hormones it's so it, it's in, uh, so having the ability to see in one center uh, a group of people who will who will evaluate the various aspects of of your of your presentation uh, and have the the true depth of expertise to to really understand what what we can offer you therapeutically in in any uh, in any of the aspects of this uh, that uh, that will will I think get patients to 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 have a a, a better uh, a, a better pathway towards therapy and, uh, and, and a better ability to, uh, to, to, to find the, the best uh, way forward. Um, it's, it's something that I see often enough in, in patients who, who have been seen by their, by their primary oncologist, let us say, and been offered a certain path of care, which which in retrospect may have may have narrowed their their window of opportunity for for other aspects of care down the road so being such a rare disease i, I think it's 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 really crucial to try and find uh, people with with real expertise who are in the same room as other people with real expertise uh, in in the various aspects I think that's such a good point about like a surgeon is probably going, going to, you know, going to want to do surgery or that's, that's their default on most. And, and since we, I, we talk about this uh, very frequently on the show, like each case is different and each, uh, each patient has their own set of goals. Sure. And I think that's really considered from what I've learned uh, hosting the show, that that's something that's really considered by most doctors. And so even though they're seeing a surgeon, surgery might not be the best case for that particular patient. Sure. So sure. Yeah, I think that's a, such a great point to, 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 to make 
about why we should have those different perspectives. And uh, we've already got a lot of people joining us today. Um, we're over 100 people already, and it's very early. So that's exciting. And I have a question. We have lots of questions rolling in. So I'm going ahead and start taking them. But a question that, that pertains to that a little bit, what you were saying, Nancy says, my primary oncologist of 12 years is retiring this year. And I'm going to have to find, uh, going to have to have care transferred to a general oncologist whom I've never met. Okay, that's probably a common issue that Nancy's facing. What do you suggest that I discuss discuss with him when we start working together? I do have a net oncologist and a net surgeon at Penn who are fo following me, but distantly. So this, so Nancy is dealing with a new doctor. No idea what what level of knowledge they might have about this disease. Where does she start? Well, I think it's it's really important to have a, a frank discussion with the with the doctor about about what he or she, uh, you know, what level of expertise he or she has had. And uh, depending on how far you pin is, is from your, is from your local center, whether, whether this doctor has, has established relationships with, with, with some of your providers at UPenn. Uh, if you ask the, the, the UPenn doctors, it, I think it's some, so, sometimes helpful for you to to ask the, the UPenn doctors whether they have established relationships with with providers in your in your location that sort of work well with them uh, over the years because yeah we do find uh, that 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 uh, while most local providers we, we get on really well with in a in a collaborative manner. Uh, we sometimes have local providers who, who I think just don't have the ex experience in, in neuroendocrine tumors and therefore don't really get the nuances and the, and, and the differences in, in, uh, that, that are inherent in taking care of a, of a person with, with a, a slow growing uh, neuroendocrine tumor versus uh, versus other much more common uh, cancers that 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 the oncologist is dealing with, so um, so I think a, a, a frank discussion with that with that provider about his or her level of ease with 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 dealing with your established UPenn physicians, if you're if you're uneasy after that. Uh, because of uh, you know, a, a sense of resistance there, uh, a, a talk with the folks at UPenn as to who they have, uh, you know, they have they have great experience in with 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 working with with multiple uh, physicians in the community. So so they will also have a have a, a sort of a track record with with many physicians in 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 the in the community. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Nancy, for your question. I know, and I know that might be challenging uh, to have that frank discussion, but it's important. And I think this is a great chance to be your own best advocate, as they say often in, in this community. And and right. I think it could be challenging. I'm certainly not a net expert, but I am a communications expert, and I would just say, just be honest with how you what you're concerned about and straightforward. Sometimes it's hard, especially with a, a doctor, but I think it's very important. So I, I hope that that helps. Sure. And, and, and what other thing, Rain, Please, if, yes. uh, uh, it's uh, not only talking to the folks at UPenn, but, uh, but within the, within the, you know, the, 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 the community groups and the, uh, and, and mm -hmm. the Facebook groups, you know, you will find people in your general area who, who are also dealing with this, this rare condition as well, and mm -hmm. uh, getting a sense from them as to, uh, what what the experience with 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 various providers in in the area is? Excellent point. And Nancy, this is a big benefit of the show is is not just the information we get from our our experts, but the the community that's here and the, the you sure. all sharing your experiences and stories with each other. So reach out to people that I, I plus one that so wholeheartedly and, and hopefully someone um, someone here on the show can help or, or someone else support group something like that. So good luck on your journey and uh, let us know if you have any other questions. Marsha is up next. Marsha says, what is the best way to control serotonin in order to improve gastro problems with gas? Are there any suggested controls? And a few other people have, have this question as well. So control serotonin uh, to, to, to deal with problems of gas. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing that that uh, that uh, comes to mind initially is is to uh, perhaps be clear on uh, on on what the cause of this gas is. 
So uh, there, for example, um, Somatostatin, somatostatin analogs, which is your sandostatin LAR, your lanreotide, your octreotide, uh, those control serotonin, but they can actually give you more gas mm. because they have a side effect of, of decreasing pancreas enzyme uh, production. Your pancreas is your digestion organ. If, if, uh, if these agents de decrease your digestion enzymes, uh, you you will have more gas because because the food that's undigested is essentially getting digested by bacteria, uh, which produce a lot of gas. So in that situation, uh, it's 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 not further controlling your serotonin. You just keep on taking your sandostatin or whatever for your serotonin, but you add in pancreas enzyme supplements. So that can be something as simple as papaya extract tablets. Uh, or something more sophisticated. There are uh, the creon pancreolipase. There are a variety of of of, uh, of uh, pancreas enzyme uh, supplements. Um, gas uh, uh, gas and and gastrointestinal symptoms in an individual who's had a, a carcinoid tumor and may have had a previous surgery and may have had uh, um, gallbladder removed, it, 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 it can be a, a multifactorial issue because you can have bacteria which are usually growing in the, in the colon migrating up into the small bowel producing gas. It's very helpful to, uh, to uh, uh, sometimes have a, a consultation with a gastroenterologist to, to be clear on the, the source of your, of your symptom problem, because in that second uh, uh, cause of, of gas, the bacterial overgrowth, uh, uh, sometimes a, a person needs antibiotics uh, to, to take care of bacterial overgrowth. So uh, not a simple, uh, th there are other ways of controlling serotonin apart from, uh, apart from the, the, the sandostatin, the lanreotide, octreotide, there is zermelo, uh, which controls serotonin, decreases serotonin level, and is there to decrease diarrhea. But the, the, the gas may not be, may not be a pure uh, outcome of the serotonin level. So I'd, I'd, I'd caution you on, uh, on A, thinking about something simple like pancreas enzyme supplements if you are on sandostatin or, 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 or the like, uh, and B, uh, considering whether you need to see a gastroenterologist to be clear on what the symptom you're having is related to. I got it. Thanks, Marsha. Hopefully that helps. Next question from Michelle. Michelle says, ever since my distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy in 2016, my thyroid numbers have been up, then normal, then up again. I saw an endocrinologist at the cancer center I go to. They felt my neck, but never did any tests or scans. Should I try to see another endocrinologist and could my thyroid issues be connected to my PNEDs? Very interesting question. Um, so uh, just off the top of my head, I would say that, that the, the PNET is not, uh, is not uh, uh, particularly associated with, with, with a thyroid disorder. Um, however, um, I mentioned uh, side, effects of, um, side effects of the agents that we typically use for, uh, for carcinoid tumors, the sandostatin, the, the monthly injections, let us say, sandostatin lanreotide, um, they can have an effect uh, of decreasing the ability of the thyroid to make thyroid hormone and, and require a, a thyroid supplement. Um, the, uh, furthermore, uh, if you're on thyroid supplements at all, uh, again, with, uh, with, with a history of, of removal of part of your pancreas and perhaps use of, of those monthly injections. Uh, again, going back to pancreas enzymes, you, you, may, you may have an alteration of the ability to absorb thyroid hormone supplements. So that can, can, can complicate things. Now, um, you mentioned your thyroid levels going up. Well, thyroid, thyroid, blood levels are a, are a complex thing in themselves because uh, there's 
So one of them, the TSH, if it's up, that means your thyroid isn't functioning. Mm. Uh, if the T4 is up, it means your thyroid is over-functioning. So I'm a little bit unclear on, uh, on, on, on what your issue is. Most people talk about their TSH going up, which is under-function of the thyroid. Under-function of thyroid is a very common disorder in and of itself, irrespective of, uh, of, uh, of, of peanuts. So uh, a couple of things that are, that are related to the therapy of peanuts are the, 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 uh, the, the complications after peanut surgery. Uh, but, uh, I'm a little unclear on the, on, on the details of the, of the thyroid. No, no other direct relationship that I think of with the thyroid. Got it. Well, thanks, Michelle. Uh, hope that helped, but if you have any, um, clarification or any other information you want to send and you're still, you're still tuned in, go ahead and let us know. We'll try to get back to your question. Yeah. Uh, hey, Wendy, I see Wendy says, uh, can we talk about COVID and cancer yet? Give me a little bit more to go on, um, Wendy. I know that there, that is a common concern, but let me let me know what your specific question is. Marty, I see you sent a little uh, donation. Thank you so much. That helps very much. Folks, if you just joined us or join us late, this is Carson on Cancer Foundation's Luncheon with the Experts. We are here with Dr. Joseph Dillon from the University of Iowa and our numbers are looking outstanding. It says a lot about the reputation of our guests. So we're happy to have them. Thanks again, Dr. Dillon. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, from Tina. Hi, I'm really tired. My fatigue seems to be worsening. Is this normal with stage four carcinoid cancer of the liver? So, um, um, Tiredness is uh, is uh, another complicated uh, symptom. It has it has so many uh, potential inputs uh, to uh, to tiredness, um, um, and and those uh, can include um, in a person who has no form of cancer at all. Uh, one might think of uh, one might think of poor sleep and disturbed sleep. Uh, one thing to uh, to look into uh, right off the top uh, medications that uh, that are that are used either for the cancer or for uh, other other disorders uh, a profound cause of, of tiredness um, there's a particular form of anemia that uh, can occur in people with really any form of long-term disease. It's called the anemia of chronic disease, and, and that can lead to uh, and contribute to tiredness. Um, in people then who have, who have cancers, you've, you've told me that the, that, the can, that the neuroendocrine tumor is in the liver. Uh, it's presumably come from either the, the uh, could have come from the, the bowel or the, or the pancreas. Uh, uh, those would be the, the perhaps the, uh, the, the most, mo most often uh, sources. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, Primary tumors, uh, if any of those are there, there may be there may be bleeding in the bowel again, causing anemia, iron deficiency, which is a reversible cause of uh, of, of tiredness. Uh, coming back to uh, the 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 problem of pancreas enzymes reminds me of absorption of nutrients. Uh, many people who have had removal of of a part of their small bowel lose the ability to absorb their vitamin B12, mm. can cause tiredness, uh, can also eventually cause anemia. Mm. Um, uh, over and above that, uh, then it is. Uh, it is also true that uh, uh, that uh, uh, cancer that has metastasized, really any form of cancer, uh, seems to be associated with uh, with with production of, of 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 chemicals that can be associated with tiredness. And I and I lean on my medical oncology colleagues for uh, for more sort of uh, um, uh, understanding uh, of that, but. But uh, they 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 see uh, fatigue as a as a as a common complaint in in all forms of uh, of of cancer, and another major uh, uh, component to 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 think about uh, because it's so 
important in terms of fatigue is mood and and how how you're actually dealing with the stress of this stage four disease and and whether whether there are there are uh, there's uh, a, an element of depression again uh, um, uh, contributing to this sort of multifactorial symptom which is fatigue so many things to many things to to look at there and 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 try and work on uh, and and try and get help with from from sleep from mood uh, from looking at other medications that 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 you might be on, from uh, anemia, uh, nutrient deficiencies related to to malabsorption, uh, um, and then just a, a generalized fatigue that's associated with 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 many cancers. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. Next question from Julie. Julie says, "SI primary, which is the small intestine, yes, uh, with yes. mets to the liver, pelvis, and spine." If, if the disease progresses while on monthly santostatin shots, what determines if a change in shots is needed or PRT or any other treatments? And a lot of other people have this concern as well. Sure. So, uh, so uh, sandostatin, lanreotide, the, the monthly injections uh, are the, the most typical uh, sort of first uh, uh, our first treatment, our first treatment after, after a surgical procedure. Uh, um, they they uh, work work well for uh, for 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 symptoms and for inhibiting tumors, but they uh, only work for a, a certain length of time. Um, so so eventually you uh, you you do come to the to a, a visit with the with your with your physician and and uh, and evidence that 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 there's progression. And so so. Again, here's where I think uh, uh, having uh, uh, the ability to to meet with uh, uh, a few different physicians to really think about the the next options is important. Yes, PRT is a next option in people who have been using and benefiting from monthly injections. Uh, they would presumably have the the ability to respond to. A radioactive form of those monthly injections, which is what PRRT is. However, depending on the the specific details of the the progression, is that progression only in the liver and the and the pelvis seems stable? Is that progression only in a one or two bone areas, but the liver seems stable? Those details are important in 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 thinking about whether let us say it was bone disease in one or two places, whether, and, and, and that was giving rise to pain, whether an external beam of radiation therapy to those areas would be, uh, would be appropriate. Or if it was only in liver uh, with, with everything else staying stable, suggesting that the, that the monthly shot was holding everything else stable, uh, a, the, one conversation should be whether whether a liver embolization procedure would be or a liver ablation procedure uh, would be preferable to using PRRT. Again, there's one of the things that I like to think about is if disease is progressing in only one location, then is there a treatment that we can use for only one location? Because yes, you will have PRRT at some stage in your life. It, it, it may be that you need PRRT now if, if there are multiple locations that are, that are progressing. But um, with, the, with the current forms of PRRT, you, you get to have PRRT uh, approximately twice. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, enough radiation, uh, or that's as much radiation as your bone marrow can take. So uh, these these things have to be thought about strategically. And the the third aspect of the of the multidisciplinary approach to your situation of progress in uh, it with 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 your disease would be whether whether it would be preferable to uh, to 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 put you on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a medication such as Everolimus, for example, uh, or there will be new medications uh, coming out in that, in that space, I think in the, in the next couple of years and, and medications, which might be in clinical trial at the moment. So 
having having a discussion uh, which which reviews all of the pros and cons of of all of those things and i would include the pros and cons of of reoperation a tumor debulking in the liver for for an individual who has you know significant liver tumor change but nothing else going on elsewhere all of those things i like to have all of the options on the table each time we have to have the discussion of okay it's changing what do we do now mm -hmm. great thank you uh next question from rose many of net patients are on a therapy of octreotide since octreotide inhibits the amount of human growth hormone what are the effects on the body related to in inhibiting this hormone and is there any way to counteract the negative effects of reducing the hgh now, i haven't heard this question before so it's a, it's a, it's a super interesting question. It's a super interesting question for me to think about as a, as a, an endocrinologist mm -hmm. because um, somatostatin, it's, uh, it's role in, in, uh, in, in early life. And uh, actually the name somatostatin, uh, it's a, a statin for, for somatotrophin, which is growth hormone. So, so it's initial, it's initial discovery was as an inhibitor of growth hormone and, and, and important in, uh, in the, the growth phase uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, um, of humans. So, uh, and indeed, before it became uh, approved for, for, um, for carcinoid syndrome and, uh, and, and neuroendocrine tumors, it was approved for the, uh, the condition of acromegaly, which is a, which is a pituitary tumor producing, overproducing growth hormone. So it's a potent reducer of growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So um, that gets on to the, the whole sort of, controversial and, and still, I think, controversial area uh, of, of growth hormone deficiency in adults. Growth hormone deficiency in children, there's, there's no doubt about that one. Children, if they have growth hormone deficiency, should be given growth hormone, uh, unless there's a specific, uh, a specific contraindication reason why not, uh, because growth is so important. Um, once uh, once a, a child becomes a, an adult, uh, a child who's been on growth hormone becomes an adult, mm -hmm. there is still a lot of controversy as to whether to, 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 to continue growth hormone, which appears to be important for uh, muscle mass, appears to be important for, for, for fat mass mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and maybe cholesterol profiles, but, but is... Uh, it, it still remains controversial. So, so the the question then of uh, of of whether to give growth hormone to to an individual who's on somatostatin would have a that same controversy. B, uh, it, it could have even more controversy uh, because growth hormone is a growth hormone, uh, and therefore you uh, would have to. Uh, be very clear, and I am not very clear on the data. You would have to be very clear that that growth hormone is not a a, a growth enhancer for neuroendocrine tumors. Mm. It's a growth enhancer for uh, people who have excess growth hormone uh, have increased colonic tumors, for example. So, so I would have a I would have a real question as to whether whether growth hormone may actually have negative consequences, uh, and uh, then whether it has whether it has positive effects on, uh, on say, muscle mass, uh, body fat content, mm -hmm. it, it may, but there may be other ways to, uh, to, to, to tackle those, uh, those uh, aspects that, that, that don't re uh, 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 require actual injection of growth hormone. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, moving along, uh, David says, many NET patients develop diabetes. Do you think there's a link between NETs and somatostatin analogs, such as monthly injections? What would you advise patients regarding the risk of diabetes, if any? So uh, it is a, a well-known side effect of somatostatin analogs, your monthly injections, your daily octreotide. It is, they inhibit the uh, 
the production of insulin. They are used specifically uh, in individuals who have the, the pancreatic tumor called insulinoma, where, where it's producing excessive insulin. They're used specifically to decrease insulin. Um, and they, they will decrease insulin uh, in, in people uh, with, with, uh, who have normal pancreatic function. So the, the usual testing for, uh, for, for, for blood sugar control and diabetes uh, uh, over and above a blood sugar, uh, the, the doc, uh, your doctor will frequently test, uh, 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 use a test called a hemoglobin A1C, which mm -hmm. gives an estimate of average blood sugar over the prior three months. And that hemoglobin A1C will, in the normal, uh, the entirely normal individual will go up to 6%. Mm -hmm. Hemoglobin A1C will be pushed up by 0.3 or 0.4 percent by initiation of octreotide, lanreotide, uh, sandostatin, and higher doses will push it up a little higher, so up to 0.5 percent. So that may be the difference between getting a person who has what we would call pre-diabetes or uh, you know on the borderline of diabetes into a diagnosis of diabetes, and it is. It is a side effect of the medication. Every medication has a side effect. You, you need to do the cost-benefit analysis uh, on, on any medication. I think that the, that the beneficial effect on, uh, on, on tumor growth and, and tumor symptoms far outweighs the, the, the known and, and definite increase uh, in, in blood sugar. If the blood sugar gets into the diabetes range, then you have diabetes. Hmm. You have to deal with diabetes uh, in the ways that diabetes is dealt with. Uh, a focus on exercise, a focus on diet, a focus on weight, and a focus then on, on medications. Got it, got it. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question from Ken who says, how long do or sh should we stay on Sandostatin LAR uh, shots for carcinoid syndrome, or is there, or is there a length? He's been on for two years at this point. Mm -hmm. So carcinoid syndrome, uh, that is the, the symptoms, uh, which, uh, include flushing diarrhea in some people, wheezing, uh, palpitations, uh, uh, carcinoid syndrome, those, those symptoms, if you've got carcinoid syndrome, then I would suggest that you that you consider staying on uh, staying on a monthly injection for as long as that monthly injection is uh, is helping your carcinoid syndrome. Um, uh, the uh, a, a person who has uh, carcinoid syndrome uh, or uh, or any other. Uh, hormone production from, uh, from uh, neuroendocrine tumors, such as uh, excessive insulin production for an, from an insulinoma or glucagon production from a uh, glucagon producing pancreatic tumor. All of those people will, will, will benefit in terms of symptoms from use of, of the medication. So I, I think perhaps the, the, the question is also, related to to the understanding that that these agents do have a do have a a, 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 a duration of of anywhere in, in in various studies anywhere from 18 to 36 months of inhibiting tumor growth mm -hmm. uh, which sometimes goes along with 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 the symptoms sometimes doesn't go along with the symptoms um, so uh, in in those individuals there may be a, a need, by two years, for example, to be uh, either adding a different medication or moving on to some of the other therapies that we that we talked about before for tumor growth. Uh, however, the 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 effect on tumor symptoms, carcinoid syndrome, is a long lasting effect. And while you have those symptoms, uh, and as long as the side effects of the monthly injection do not outweigh the benefit on the symptoms, I would counsel that that you should consider continuing on the uh, the, the the somatostatin analog. Got it. 
Thank you. Next question, folks. We got about 20 minutes left. We're getting a lot of value. And I see you all sending the little heart emojis and like emojis, letting me know that you're getting that value. That is helpful. It's a visual cue. So I know we're doing our job. Next question from Perry. Perry, I'm not sure I've seen your name before. So if you are new to the show, welcome. Or if this is your first time asking a question, thanks. Perry says, I've had three Lutathera treatments and the flushiness and, and, and clamminess has increased. Do you have any recommendations for that? So um, that's, uh, that's a very interesting and, it, and it's a very specific, uh, specific uh, question, but, but let me uh, toss out some, some generalities here. So uh, Ludothera treatments, uh, they, they occur every two months usually. Um, so you're, you're sort of, uh, you're sort of uh, presumably coming up to coming up to a fourth one. Now, after a Ludothera treatment, after injection of that, uh, of that radioactive substance, which then attaches to your tumors, uh, there will be an effect of the, of, of the radiation to start to start damaging, injuring, and, and killing tumor cells. As tumor cells get damaged and injured, you can have, uh, you can have even more serotonin or uh, other, uh, other chemicals being, uh, being um, uh, uh, coming out of the, the, the dying tumor. So one of the side effects of uh, of uh, of PRT in the shorter term is that uh, a person can actually notice increased symptoms of of their traditional carcinoid symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, increased diarrhea, increased pain if that was a if that was a, a, a previous symptom, increased uh, increased flushing. Um, usually by the end of the two months, uh, even by even at a shorter time in, in most people, that is that is resolving itself. But but those symptoms uh, that that exacerbation of symptoms uh, can can last longer in, in some individuals that set of symptoms would be anticipated. That set of symptoms is related really to damage of the tumor. Uh, and and would be anticipated to uh, to resolve eventually. Now, in the meantime, it 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 might be helpful. I uh, our practice at at Iowa, and I think most most uh, most institutions' practice is to is to try and continue on the sendostatin analog, the the monthly injections throughout uh, throughout the. Uh, throughout the the, the the Ludothera, in some places, because of timing of Ludothera, there are injections that are skipped, and you're you're then not covering your carcinoid symptoms, so so they're they're increasing. Now, if that's the situation, uh, I would suggest uh, uh, using using the the short term self injected octreotide if you've if you've got access to self injected octreotide to handle the the uh, the the excess carcinoid symptoms if you're if you're off cycle with your uh, with your with your monthly injection or you're you're recognizing higher higher levels of the symptoms related to uh, related to the PRT so so those might be uh, two things that that you could think of uh, uh, in 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 relationship to to your problem. Got it. Thank you. Appreciate it, Perry. Hopefully that helped. Next question from A. G. Our friend from Tennessee. Please share your definition slash interpretation of carcinoid crisis versus an episode of severe carcinoid syndrome symptoms. Definition resolution. Right. So. Um, Carcinoid crisis uh, and, and and severe carcinoid syndrome. This is a continuum. Okay. Um, uh, as the as the as the carcinoid uh, symptoms get get uh, more severe, as the flushing gets uh, more severe and and more profoundly whole body, uh, a person will. Uh, dilate all of their blood vessels, and they will drop their blood pressure. Uh, a fall of, of blood pressure can then be associated with, with altered mentation, altered level of consciousness. Um, 
Now, in a in a full blown carcinoid crisis, we have we have the blood pressure is off, mm -hmm. the 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 mentation is off. A person might be uh, having loss of consciousness. Uh, uh, a person uh, the the their ability to to regulate their their body temperature is off. This this profound. Uh, uh, um, uh, widening of their blood vessels, causing the uh, the, the 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 redness, the the, the flushing, uh, will uh, will 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 give rise to fever. Also, um, the the profound diarrhea will uh, will will further add to uh, to to loss of of blood pressure. So it's. Um, you know, it, it's easy to, 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 to say when I, when, when I see a person in the intensive care unit, they're on a ventilator, they're on a, a bunch of medications to, to maintain their blood pressure uh, and, and, their, uh, and, their, and their bright red, uh, they're in a crisis situation. Um, but at, at some stage, that person has gone through starting off a carcinoid uh, symptom Getting more severe with their carcinoid symptoms, uh, and uh, and and eventually getting to the stage of dropping their blood pressure because of either the the flushing and or the the the, the loss of, uh, of 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 volume of, of of fluid related to to diarrhea. So, um, again, I would I would define uh, the, the the technical definition of a crisis would be when it gets to the level of either altered mentation, altered blood pressure, altered uh, um, thermal regulation, body temperature, uh, but uh, making, making the cut between, between severe uh, carcinoid syndrome and, and that is, uh, is, is, is somewhat, somewhat difficult. The treatment is going to be the same. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, the treatment initially is uh, lots of octreotide, and then, if the if the if the blood pressure uh, is is becoming an issue, lots of intravenous fluids and other agents to enhance the blood pressure, uh, and um, uh, uh, eventually, as as you get into crisis, there may be even even need for intensive care. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Ag. Glad to hear you're doing well in Tennessee, despite the situation. Uh, we, Dr. Uh, Dylan, we've had a few questions about, uh, appropriately so, about COVID, about the vaccine. Um, and so uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Ken says, are there any studies showing it is safe to receive the COVID-19 vaccine specifically for net, ca net cancer patients? And then I also had a question earlier from Lorraine about specifically the, the third shot. Like, do you suggest the third shot? So two-part two question. Any studies showing the the safety of, of the vaccine for net patients? So um, this is not an area of high expertise for me. Um, I was involved in the, uh, in the initial uh, guidelines uh, uh, committee paper um, uh, that Emily Bergsland was the lead author on from Nanets about, about COVID and uh, COVID and, uh, and, and NETS. It seems so, so long ago. It was a whole year and a bit ago. Um, I don't know of any net specific, um, uh, net specific studies uh, in, in relationship to COVID uh, or the COVID vaccine. Um, uh, in, in taking advice from my medical oncology colleagues, uh, infectious disease colleagues, uh, and, and listening to what comes down the pike from, from CDC, uh, I have been uh, very, um, uh, I, I have stressed to people that I, that I believe that they should get the COVID vaccine. Um, uh, the, the, the question about uh, third shot COVID vaccine is, is now uh, coming out as, right. as an issue. And uh, I am uh, again, uh, listening for advice from, uh, from, other, uh, from other colleagues and, uh, and experts in this, in this field. I guess the, the current advice is uh, 
uh, third shot for individuals over 65. But then the question is, in a person with uh, with with cancer in general or mm -hmm. uh, neuroendocrine cancer in particular, uh, what what is the the added benefit versus added risk? Uh, and I I I I don't uh, I don't have an opinion on third shots at this stage. Got it. Thank you for that. And hopefully that helps. And there's a uh, response from Brian in the comment sections that I would suggest everybody read just kind of a good, Hey, you know, many of us are, most of us are not experts on this. And, you know, I've been following the advice and I have a lot of faith in my medical team and their guidelines. So I just think it's a decent, but this a decent overall approach, but I think a lot of people have this question. It's understandable why, um, you know, why, why they might. And so I think this is a good opportunity for, you all, you know, to, sh to share those experiences we were talking about uh, earlier before. So um, moving on. Well, we have a question from Jim that says, I'm a new member and working with a large East Coast Medical Center in Maryland. Is there a way to contact you, Dr. Dillon, directly? Are, are you uh, open to that? And if so, what's the easiest way to reach you, Dr. Dillon? Sure. Well, everybody at the University of Iowa has the, the, same, uh, the same email. Uh, it's first name hyphen, last name, uiowa, u-i-o-w-a dot edu. Uh, and we could, we could start from there. Now, this, this brings up, however, another, uh, another uh, issue, and uh, it's a, an issue that's been, that's been changing over the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the issue of, with all of the, the, uh, the, 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 the risk uh, inherent in sort of going to medical centers and certainly in, in, in going to distant medical centers for, for sort of tertiary care, um, are, there, are there ways to, can we improve the, 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 the telehealth, uh, um, the ability to do telehealth and, and long-term con consultations? Um, and um, uh, in relationship to that, uh, during during early COVID times, there were there were specific changes in 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 medical re regulations in our state and in a number of states that that allowed me to actually have telehealth conversations uh, with individuals and give medical advice across state lines. Uh, didn't work with with all states. It's a very much a, a state by state a state by state issue. Uh, unfortunately, that that early broadening related to the early wave of, 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 so the early broadening of ability for me to do telehealth from, from Iowa uh, has been lost. I can do telehealth with, with anyone in the state of Iowa. Um, uh, it's different for, for, for different states. So, so uh, a tertiary uh, specialist provider in, in certain states may may still be able to uh, do uh, long-term uh, telehealth uh, communication. So that's that's uh, still an issue which uh, which inhibits uh, the full ability to to achieve uh, um, uh, long distance uh, communication, uh, full long distance communication uh, in terms of healthcare issues. Got it. Thank you. Folks, we've, oh, the time is moving by quickly. A lot of great questions today. We've got just a little more than five minutes, so we're going to keep trying to answer as many questions as we can. Sharon says, just joined, not sure if this was discussed, but it seems most treatments depend on somatostatin receptors. What if you lack them uh, as per dotatate scan? And if there's a two centimeter tumor in the retroperitoneal shown in the MRI with numerous liver mets, unknown primary, what is the usual plan of attack that would cause pain? And what... And would that cause pain while eating? That's a lot of questions there, Sharon, and a little case specific. But let's start with the first one, which is, what do you, what do you do if you lack uh, somatostatin receptors? So that is, um, you know, that is a, a situation in uh, in uh, at least fifteen percent of people, and and it's more uh, uh, with with uh, with, uh, with with certain uh, neuroendocrine tumors than with others. So so allele neuroendocrine tumors uh, tend to have very high number uh, of of those with a excuse me would have somatostatin receptors somewhat lesser for pancreatic and and lesser still 
for uh, for lung uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, the the absence of of somatostatin receptors does really alter the uh, the the the. The, the the therapies available as you've as you've as you've understood mm -hmm. um I think just a couple of, it, it, it was a quite a specific question and quite a specific case. I, I think it's really important for you uh, uh, to have your pathology reviewed by a, an expert pathologist to see if there are any hints there as to what the primary location of this tumor is because primary location can, uh, can influence specific therapy. Um, uh, in in this uh, situation, uh, particularly, um, um, uh, although a, a patient might might meet me if they were uh, if they were coming to the University of Iowa, they would be they would be following more heavily with my medical oncology colleagues and perhaps surgical oncology uh, uh, um, and interventional radiology for, uh, for assistance on the question of, of, of whether uh, tumor embolization of, of liver tumors would be, uh, would be appropriate. Uh, so I think uh, pathology reevaluation, uh, if, it hasn't, if it hasn't been done, um, a focus on, uh, on medical oncology interventions chemotherapies, uh, novel therapies, clinical trials, uh, 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 a focus on uh, interventional radiology, ablations or embolizations of liver, and uh, a question of, of, of whether, uh, whether uh, a surgical option for, for some level of debulking of, of, of tumor uh, would, be, uh, would be available in the hands of an expert surgeon. Got it. Got it. And folks, uh, folks at home listening, there's a lot of comments back and forth about the, the COVID and the shots and the vaccine and all that. So exactly what we were talking about with sharing experiences, uh, it's within the comment section. So check that out. Um, Tony says, I'm interested to get Dr. Dillon's experience, if any, of the reoccurrence of carcinoid heart disease following valve replacement surgery. Any thoughts or experience with that, Dr. Dillon? So this is this is where I'd be reaching out to my cardiology colleagues, uh, and yeah. um, uh, it does occur. Uh, it uh, it occurs uh, particularly in in people who have higher serotonin. Um, but uh, uh, once uh, once a person has has carcinoid heart disease, uh, I am making sure to 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 have our our cardiologist meet with them uh, every time they're they're meeting with me so i'm sorry to to sort of seem to to blow that one off but i i no. think it's a i think it's a, a a great a great question for uh for a, a cardiology uh, expert and uh and, and tony to that to that point um you know, I talked about earlier in the show how we've created a lot of video content over the past 10 years. Well, even very recently on this show, so you can just go back in the videos tab and look at the Lunch with the Expert show specifically. We had Dr. Jerry Zox on uh, oh, from, great. Yeah, from yeah, New yeah. York, who is, you know, specializes in, in this aspect. And so I would suggest maybe going back and yeah. watching that video for starters. Uh, to, to, to learn more about carcinoid heart disease and that sort of stuff. Cause we went in depth cause that's really his, his, uh, his niche. Yeah. So, um, so I would suggest doing that. We had a question earlier. I think we probably got time for one more Dr. Dillon. This comes up frequently too. Jessica asked, does net, do, do nets have a hereditary or hereditary components? Right. So Usual statement about nets is that uh, is that it's it's not a hereditary disease, and the, okay. the sort of the, the caveats to that would be I would say it's it's ninety to ninety five percent not known to be a hereditary disease. There are hereditary forms of nets. Okay, uh, they occur in 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 very classic syndromes, multiple endocrine neoplasia type one, where a person might have a pituitary tumor, parathyroid tumor, neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, and perhaps other nets, lung. Uh, our, our small bowel. Mm -hmm. uh, other, other forms of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor uh, occur in patients with uh, 
von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, which has another whole set of, uh, of other very characteristic, uh, very characteristic features. A lot of work going on both at NIH. I know we have we have a study ongoing of family members with nets looking for uh, looking for for new genes there. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a there was a new gene that was uh, isolated in in apparently one family with nets. So uh, there are ongoing studies of that. There are some some classical uh, 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 syndromes that are actually very straight, fairly straightforward to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to recognize because they, they, they appear with so many other, uh, other characteristic features. Got it. Well, thanks for your questions, everybody. We are at the one o'clock hour. So that is our show for today, but Dr. Dylan, I, I got to thank you again so much for, for joining us, especially late notice. We really, really appreciate you being here. Sure. Thanks, Rain. It was, it was my pleasure. Absolutely. And thanks to you all at home. Again, as always, we hope that this program helped answer some of your questions. And again, reach out to CCF at carcinoid.org if you have any uh, further questions. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without this program or without their support, this program wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. Thank you for watching. I have been your host. And please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.